notes here. Full screen. Yeah. All right. Um, so in today's presentation, I'll start to give uh, an introduction to tribology and following by a brief history. Uh, and then we will uh, talk about uh, different type of friction uh, phenomenon. And also we will have a look at the wear mechanisms. And um, after that, uh, we talk about the lubrication and different type of lubrication regimes. Um, after uh, the lubrication, we will look at the surface roughness definition. And uh, at the end, we will look at the practical implication of these uh, characteristics in the mixed DHL numerical simulation, how we uh, use that and why we need that uh, in order to, to do the estimation for the efficiency of uh, uh, gearbox. So the definition of tribology is the science of interacting surfaces in relative motion. So uh, that means mainly it will deal with friction, adhesion, wear, and lubrication. And um, some rough estimation has been shown that around 6% of gross national product in US alone is going for friction and wear losses. And if you look at the you know, world scale, uh, one third of world energy appears as friction in one form or another. So what benefits we get um, with the improved lubrication design and practices? Uh, in a study with uh, Dr. Peter Just uh, from UK has shown that if we um, try to improve the lubrication uh, mechanisms, um, as you can see in this study, uh, he showed that the two highest gain that we can get is one in the maintenance and repair costs, and the other one is, of course, saving in loop buys. Um, and the, the, the second, uh, actually, uh, based, uh, best uh, benefit that we can get is using less energy uh, and um, having a more optimum operation by reducing the friction losses. So the overall goal here is to transfer mechanical power with the lowest possible friction loss and minimal wear of mating surfaces. And if you look at the history of uh, tribology, it goes you know, far back to the ancient Asia, uh, uh, Egyptian. As you can see in this picture, uh, this guy, uh, it seems to uh, you know, try to put some type of lubrication um, at beneath the stone to make the movement of this huge uh, stone easier by the people. And also um, in 15th century, Leonardo da Vinci also had some studies uh, on friction right, as depicted in his drawings. Uh, and also in 1800, uh, in 18th century, uh, Mr. Colomb also tried to uh, understand the behavior of surfaces uh, at the presence of uh, irregularities and how it can be interpreted into the you know, friction uh, definition. So if we start by looking at the sliding friction uh, part, as you can see, uh, generally speaking, we define the friction as a resistance against movement of two objects in relative motion. So if we plot the required force to move the, surface, the, the object over a given surface, the required force is increasing up to a threshold. At that threshold, then the object is starting to move. And after a certain distance and time, it, become to, uh, it, it comes to equilibrium. 
So uh, that's why we uh, have a definition for free, uh, static friction force that is required to overcome the initial adhesion between two surfaces and start the movement. And then uh, the equilibrium uh, state is uh, called the dynamic friction force. And of course, we have two types of friction. One is the useful friction. We need it in order to do uh, the transfer of motion, for example, in the, the pulley and belts or in railroad uh, or you know, moving the wheel over a uh, surface. And of course, we have the harmful fric friction that we want to avoid if it's possible. And that's because uh, between the moving surfaces, the harmful friction will usually uh, lead to uh, energy loss and material loss also. So the first person that tried to create some laws for friction behavior was Amonton. And he came up with the first law of friction based on his observation uh, and uh, proposed that the ratio of friction force over the normal load is a constant that we call, of course, uh, coefficient of friction. And he also, based on his uh, experiments and observation, came up with the second law of friction that is stating uh, friction is independent of apparent contact area. And later, um, Mr. Coulomb, by his observation and studies confirmed the first two laws of friction that uh, proposed by Amonton. And he also added a third law of friction that the friction force is independent of speed. So later um, by looking at the micro scale level, uh, Bowden and Tabor uh, decided, uh, came up with a more detailed uh, definition uh, of friction behavior between two surfaces. So when they looked at the um, microstructure of the two surfaces with the given roughness, um, they tried to propose uh, this model that the total friction force is uh, part uh, is coming uh, apart by adhesion of asperities between two surfaces. And the second part is coming from the deformation of the asperities. And uh, he, they, uh, they also uh, overall stated that function, uh, the friction is a function of, of course, physical and chemical properties of surfaces, in addition to normal load, sliding speed, contact temperature, etc. cetera. Um, now let's look at the adhesion mechanism. Uh, for the sliding friction. And what happens um, during the adhesion friction is the initial contact, of course, starts at the asperities level that of, uh, create the real area of contact. And that adhesion is due to chemical bonding between the two um, components. And it's uh, depending on the um, conforming level of two surface and two material uh, to create those bonds. Uh, when the sliding is starting started, the link between those bonds will be broken or base material, a portion of the base material will be ruptured and uh, separated. And uh, at the end, uh, upon the continuation of the sliding, the new adhesion point is building up and then separating. And this uh, phenomenon is going on. So by looking at two um, assumptions here with the elastic deformation or plastic deformation, we can draw two different conclusion here. So if the load is not too high and still we are uh, in the uh, elastic deformation level, we can assume uh, the asperities are simulating with two semi-sphere 
And by using Hertz formula, we can calculate coefficient of friction with this given formula here. And what it tells us is that friction coefficient, uh, friction coefficient uh, from adhesion in the elastic deformation field is a function of normal load, depends on the load. But if we look at the plastic domain, in the plastic deformation, of course, uh, the surface hardness is defined as the normal load divided by the, um, the plastic the deformed surface. And if we replace this uh, in the uh, coefficient of friction formula, we get this uh, correlation between the friction coefficient and the material property shear strength and the surface hardness. And now we can see that in the case of plastic deformation, uh, the friction coefficient is no longer dependent on the asperities. Sorry, may I ask a question about the yeah. previous slide? Um, so for the elastic uh, contact, uh, those red arrows show the force or yeah. W. And what is the movement that we are taking, we are looking to the friction? Because friction, we should have a movement to feel the friction, right? Uh, yeah, you see, um, as we stated here uh, in the friction laws, uh, or uh, if, you, if you look at the, uh, this picture, when you are moving, you know, we are passing that initial static stage, it is independent of movement speed. It's a constant yeah. speed, but right? Movement, so for right? that reason, yeah, for that reason, this uh, friction definition is always assuming the surfaces are moving against each other. Okay. Good, thanks. So it's, it's basically dynamic friction. Okay. So if you look at the other mechanism of the sliding friction that is called deformation. So what happens here is when the asperities are touching each other and pressed against each other after the initial adhesion, depending on the which material is harder and which one is the softer material, it can deform in two cases of fragile or ductile deformation. And uh, when we have two surfaces that are incompatible, in those cases, the friction based on deformation is the dominant case. Um, so now, if we want to do some simple math and uh, come up with the uh, you know, a approximate uh, definition of the uh, friction coefficient, we can uh, do kind of four assumption for the shape of asperities. So we can assume the asperities either are conic or spherical or cylindrical in the case of uh, horizontal orientation or vertical orientation. And if we just look for the two first case, just to have a simple definition here, um, I just did some simple math to uh, present, you know, a, a approximate uh, definition for the friction coefficient here. And the way that we do is actually, um, if we look at the contact between the uh, asperity indentation and the base material, we can see that the normal force is being balanced by the pressure multiplied by the vertical projection of that contact area. And the friction force is balanced by the same pressure uh, multiplied by the horizontal projection of uh, this contact area. So if you can uh, uh, calculate this two correlation of a normal load pressure multiplied by that uh, projection, vertical projection area and the friction the same way. And we have this uh, relationship between the depths D and uh, or radius R and uh, uh, conic angle alpha. And if we replace them into the original um, coefficient of friction, uh, we can get the friction coefficient definition as two 
uh, over pi tangent alpha for the case of conic shape. And if we do the same principle of calculation for the spheric shape, we can come up with this, this second formula here. But uh, of course, uh, for having this assumption valid, we have to have uh, the value of theta, the angle of theta is very small, should be very small, or the ratio of d per r should be less than 0 0.1 uh, for this relationship to be valid. So it's just showing a simple um, way of calculation of uh, friction coefficient. So now if we look at the rolling friction, so the difference in the rolling friction is that the initial contact is happening at one point. And if we assume that we have a rigid flat surface here and the uh, component here is softer and it's deformable. So depending on the amount of load that we put here, so this is a cylindrical body, right? So depending on the amount of load and elasticity of the component, we will have a certain amount of deformation here. And when it is rolling, you can see that because these points distance from the center of rotation is different, they will have different speed. So that means um, the R0 in the middle, since it is smaller than R1 and R2, and it is changing at this point until this point, we will have different speeds um, between this uh, area. So that's why uh, there is two zones of a sliding happening on this rotational movement. And that is where the friction is generating, of course. Um, but if even we look at the spherical component, sitting on a raceway in case of, for example, ball bearings, even without significant deformation that we saw here, still because of different distance between the contacting points with respect to the center of rotation in the direction of rotation, we will also see some sliding zone at the two ends and then uh, pure rolling happening in the middle. And that is why uh, in the case of rolling friction, if we don't have any deformation, mathematically the friction is zero. But um, if we have this scenario that by default, we will have even without deformation, some different distance, then this uh, zero uh, rolling uh, friction is not valid anymore. Um, now let's talk about wear. So the first mechanism of wear, of course, can be adhesive wear. And what it happens here is um, we usually have a softer material uh, coming into contact with a more resistant material. And after this initial contact, a portion of that softer material that is attached to the second um, more resistant material, it will be uh, separating and uh, coming off the surface from this component. Um, also, we can see that uh, there are evidence of uh, transferred layers of one material over the other one. Uh, by gradual movement of the harder material over the softer material, and those layer shear is creating this uh, phenomenon. And here there is two um, example by uh, electron microscopy shows that in this case, there was a portion of aluminum uh, attaching to the piston uh, surface. And in this case also shows the uh, a position that uh, here, you know, that layered effect has been removed uh, from the aluminum component itself. 
Um, so one of the uh, major model for the definition of where comes uh, from Mr. Arkard. And he described the amount of removed volume from where as a rela direct relationship or a linear relationship of normal load, sliding distance and hardness. And he defined uh, empir an empirical coefficient as um, adhesive wear coefficient that is normally for the moderate wear is in the range of 10 to minus four or to 10 to minus eight. And for severe wear is 10 to minus two up to 10 to minus four. Sorry, uh, may I ask a question? This yeah. hardness is the hardness of the hard metal or soft metal or which one? Uh, the softer material, the because softer usually, material. yeah, usually what happens when we have two different uh, hardness, the softer material is a start to wear off. So okay. we should use the lower, you know, the softer hardness here Thanks. between two surfaces. So now, um, you know, if we do in this graph, you see that if we plot the wear volume against a sliding distance for several uh, different materials, you can see that this linear uh, relationship that Arkart has um, proposed is valid for a wide range of materials. But um, he also um, observed that on the low load, if, if we just look at the wear rate against load, rate, load values, on the, in the low load range, this um, R card model is valid and we see an increase in the wear uh, linear to the load value. But uh, at some load points, there is a rapid jump on the wear rate for some materials. Here, for example, it shows itself on the steel. Um, and what happens, of course, it can be explained this uh, by the uh, amount of uh, break, breaking uh, between surface uh, adhesion bonds uh, under higher load and shear and probably due to some frictional heating as well. Um, another observation also uh, by some uh, hard indenter uh, over a uh, uh, usual you know, steel material showed that the um, wear coefficient is constant up to a threshold of the pressure. And from a apparent pressure around one third of the surface hardness, we see again a sharp increase in the uh, wear coefficient or wear rate. So that's why the apparent pressure uh, is determining the critical load where, when, um, where this uh, transition is happening. Um, we also, if we look at the wear rate against young modulus, uh, we see that generally wear rate is decreasing with an increase in young modulus. Now, the second type of wear, of course, is abrasive wear. And in the case of abrasive wear, of course, one component is much harder than the other one. And that is causing a material removal from the softer surface. And again, for the sake of simplification, if we assume that those asperities are looking like a conic uh, shape, uh, we can do some simple math by um, calculating again the uh, uh, asperity load by surface hardness and the um, projection of the surface. And then uh, if we calculate uh, the amount of volume that has been swept over the length of X by this conic shape, we finally get the wear volume 
with this formula that is two times of trans, uh, um, a sliding distance multiplied by the total load and the average of um, tangent theta for the total number of asperities for a given surface divided by pi and h. And of course, this formula do not consider, does not consider the accumulation of the material in front of the indenter. And that is something that in, happens in reality. And again, uh, our card model, in order to uh, propose that in order to account for such uh, phenomenon as well, it is better to use the same uh, linear correlation, but this time we uh, define the coefficient of wear uh, as a second secondary coefficient of abrasion. And uh, usually this um, coefficient of abrasion is two to three times larger than adhesive wear coefficient. Um, the last uh, type of wear uh, comes from surface fatigue. And um, when we have, let's say a roller passing over a surface, um, depending on the stresses at the surface and subsurface area, we might have uh, some cracks initiating at the surface due to some irregularities or very sharp um, contact shears at the asperity level, or um, we might have the subsurface crack initiation where it might be the position of some impure, uh, you know, uh, voids or uh, simply the place of maximum shear stress that is happening below the surface always. And all here, uh, a sample shown uh, that the initial crack has been uh, started below the surface and then propagated in two direction to create this pit. And this picture shows another example that where the crack has been initiated at the surface uh, and then propagated to the depths and come up to generate this pit. And if we also plot the you know, subsurface stress values uh, in depths, um, we can see that shear stress in case of rolling and sliding is uh, higher than pure rolling. That's why you know, when we have uh, a rolling and sliding combination, uh, we will have a higher chance of uh, rolling contact fatigue uh, happening. Um, in case that no significant adhesion or abrasion existing, um, surface fatigue can be advanced due to existing lubricant. And what happens here is um, you see that a crack is generated initially due to traction force or contact pressure and so on. And of course, the rolling motion of this component over the surface will push some portion of the oil inside the crack. And when it is passing over the crack, the crack mouse is being closed partially and it will create a high uh, pressure due to that trapped oil in the crack area. And that will increase the stress intensity at the crack tip and will cause the propagation. And of course, oil viscosity in this case has an important role because a very high viscosity uh, oil cannot enter the tiny crack and it will generally delay uh, this type of uh, phenomenon. Okay, now let's uh, talk about lubrication. Uh, as stated, 
The objective of lubrication is to separate two loaded surfaces when we maintain the relative motion between them. And we want to reduce friction and potentially reduce the wear also. Um, we can um, define the lubrication regimes in four categories. So uh, the first one is called boundary lubrication, uh, where lambda that is defined by the minimum film thickness over um, equivalent root mean square of surface softness. If the lambda is uh, less than one, that means majority of asperities are touching each other and um, the, a large part of contact area is dry contact. Um, the second category is partial lubrication or mixed DHL. So in this case, uh, the film thickness is larger. That is uh, creating a lambda usually between one to five. That's the order uh, that we uh, define for this uh, category. And the other, the third category is elastohydrodynamic lubrication. In this case, the film thickness is high enough that avoids any asperity contact and the value of lambda is usually between three and 40. Um, and the last one, of course, is the hydrodynamic lubrication that the value of lambda and film thickness is much um, higher than the previous case, specifically in the case of hydrodynamic um, journal bearings, the lambda can reach up to 100. Um, so if we also look at the level of coefficient of friction for these uh, different categories, in the case of boundary lubrication, we are looking at the coefficient of friction ranged from 0 0.05 to 0 0.02, uh, 0 0.2. Um, in the case of mixed EHL and EHL, we are looking the 0 0.003 up to 0 0.05. And of course, in the case of hydrodynamic, the uh, friction coefficient is much lower than 0 0.002. Let's start with hydrodynamic bearing. So Mr. Bouchon Tower um, is the first uh, scientist that um, came up with some experiment and observation that lead to definition of hydrodynamic effect. So what he did, uh, he created a, an oil sump and he had a shaft that is being submerged partially inside the oil sump and was rotating. And he then put a partial bronze bearing on the top of the shaft and created a hole in order to be able to do the um, lubrication as well. So what he observed when the shaft was rotating, there was some oil spilled out, uh, flowing out of the lubricator hole. And he then decided to install a pressure gauge at this hole and he could be, he could measure the pressure around 200 PSI uh, for his setup at that place. And due to these uh, two effects, he then um, concluded that uh, this bearing uh, component is actually sitting on a layer of oil uh, uh, on the top of the uh, rotating shaft. And that's what uh, he observed, uh, created this phenomenon. Um, and that is the birth of uh, hydrodynamic uh, theory. And uh, in the case of um, hydrodynamic components, we can um, have or divide them in the trust bearing uh, field and journal bearing. Um, and if we start with the trust bearing, um, we see that in the trust bearing, uh, 
there is some pads that are installed inclined uh, with respect to the rotating surface. And usually uh, the ratio of uh, B per L for these um, uh, pads, if, if we call B as width and L as length, usually B per L is greater than four. And um, the inclination uh, thickness here can be defined with this linear relationship uh, that we can uh, define M as the inclination factor defined by this uh, relationship. So if we write um, Reynolds equation, simplified Reynolds equation for this uh, domain uh, solution and we solve for the pressure, we get this uh, value or this relationship for the pressure distribution uh, below the path that this is, uh, of course, as you can see, is a parabolic uh, relationship with respect to the X. And that means we will have an increase of the oil pressure up to a given position and then reduce to zero again. And um, if we um, uh, get the differentiation of pressure uh, based on X, in order to find the place and the value of the P max, we see that the P max has been defined with this relationship that is a function of M. And as you can see here in the plot uh, that uh, for different value of inclination M, inclination factor M, uh, we see that we will have different load capacity and the pressure distribution is uh, uh, changing. And that is giving us the idea that uh, there is an optimum value for M in order to maximize load uh, capacity of this thrust bearing. And to calculate that optimum value M, we just simply uh, calculate the total load equilibrium and then do the differentiation of that total load based on M and equal to zero, then we see that this optimum value of M is 1.18. Um, if you look at the hydrodynamic journal bearing, um, we have two cases. If the load is a small, is usually um, assumed, it is assumed that the, uh, the shaft and the journal are rotating concentric against each other. And um, the friction coefficient can be calculated with this um, um, relationship. But if we um, happen to have higher loads, in that case, what happens again is at the start of rotation, the initial contact will be at the bottom point uh, or uh, here uh, at the corner point A. Um, then the point A cannot be here at the bottom because the rotation of the component and the direction of normal and friction force will create um, this uh, imbalance that force the contact uh, point A moved from center to this uh, corner area. And that is, that can be calculated again uh, if we uh, write the Reynolds equation and solve for pressure, but obviously uh, we don't need to go to that much detail here. Um, now let's uh, talk about elastohydrodynamic lubrication. So why we call it elastohydrodynamic? Because the pressure is high enough to create significant deformation on lubricated surfaces. And that's why that elastic deformation comes into uh, play and uh, they named this elastohydrodynamic regime. 
uh, where it happens mainly in gears, bearings, cams, you know, in those non-conformal contacts that has very high contact pressure. And um, if we just, uh, you know, have a generic comparison, you see that a human hair diameter is about 100 micron, but when we are talking about EHL film thickness, that separating two metallic surface is much, much lower, is in the order of 0 0.1 up to five micron. So that is a tiny um, film thickness that is enough to separate two metal from each other and prevent um, failure. Um, so if we uh, look at the uh, contact area in the EHL uh, lubrication, usually we get a constriction at the exit zone and that is uh, correlated to the sharp increase in the pressure right before outlet. And it depends also, um, you know, the amount of this sharpness, it depends also on the uh, kinematics uh, of the movement here and the viscosity of oil. Um, we can talk about two main um, type of contacts, in this case, line contact and point contact. And if we start with line contact, um, we, if we want to have a simple empirical formula to calculate the film thickness that is separating two surfaces. Um, we need geometry parameters, uh, the loading and uh, the kinematics of uh, surfaces. So we need the rolling velocity as the average speed of two surfaces. And of course, the sliding velocity as the difference of the two velocities. Um, for the geometry, uh, it is uh, usual that we simulate the two uh, contacting surfaces as a one component with the equivalent radius of the two objects over a flat surface. And in order to calculate that equivalent radius, we use uh, this relationship. And um, if we are looking at the convex surface, we use a positive value for radius. And if we are looking at the concave surface, we have to use negative radius. Um, the viscosity pressure relationship can be defined with a Barrow's equation. That is an exponential uh, function of the pressure. And uh, we need also the equivalent module of elasticity um, that is defined based on the Poisson ratio and Young modulus of two components with this formula. So Mr. Hamrak, um, based on a series of uh, simulation, uh, he proposed a semi-empirical formula to calculate film thickness at the center of the contact, central film thickness, and the minimum film thickness at the constriction zone. And in order to do so, he defined uh, three non-dimensional parameters, one for a speed, one for the material, and one for the load that is being defined by those uh, parameters that we saw in the earlier slide. And you can uh, basically, um, calculate the film thickness by this empirical formula uh, for having a rough estimation. And the same thing can be um, used for the point contact. So in the case of point contact, we just need the definition of ellipsis, uh, ellipsity, uh, ellipsity um, of the uh, contact zone, elliptical, uh, half diameter, half length, um, half axis here and half long axis. Uh, the radius, equivalent radius in the X direction and the Y direction uh, is being calculated and the ratio of RY per RX uh, um, has been uh, defined as K, the elliptical ratio. And 
then by defining the same set of uh, parameters, non-dimensional parameters, uh, Hamrock uh, proposed uh, these two um, um, formula for the film thickness calculation in the case of point contact. But um, if we want to have a better understanding in real case scenario, we cannot ignore surface roughness because uh, in reality, the surfaces are not um, smooth, they are uh, rough. And the roughness um, can be defined or looked at a larger scale that is uh, varied by waviness. And in the micro scale, that is the uh, surface roughness without the waviness effect. So um, what we usually do in the uh, measurement and uh, contact analysis, after um, you know, measuring the surface roughness with the profilometer, we remove the macro uh, waviness in order to get pure roughness on the surface. And when we get that filtered surface roughness data as a series of val valleys and asperities, uh, it is normal that we deal with these parameters. First is the uh, average value M, simply the average of all the Z values uh, that read by the uh, profilimeter. Uh, we have another uh, parameter called RA, uh, that is the centralized um, uh, uh, no, or normalized uh, difference between Z values and the average value. And then the RZ is actually, um, we divide the um, domain of measurement into five area and at each uh, area, the difference between the minimum value and the maximum value is defined by RZ. And we just simply uh, take the average of those five area to come up with the reporting RZ for that surface. But these are not enough to um, regenerate um, the surface. And we actually need um, a statistical representation in order to be able to regenerate the surface mathematically and use it in the simulation. And to do so, um, in addition to the average value, we need these parameters as well. So we need the standard deviation or root mean square. Uh, is, they are the same. Uh, parameter when the average value is uh, centered and equal to zero. And then we need the skewness and kurtosis by this definition. And what they mean, um, the statistically, um, if we plot the probability density function uh, for the asperities, the zero value for the skewness is corresponding to the Gaussian distribution. And uh, with the uh, negative skewness, that means we will have deeper valleys. And with the positive skewness, that means we, will, we, we have a sharper, you know, a, a larger asperities. And uh, it can, it's a kind of uh, a symmetrical uh, distribution. Then uh, we have kurtosis, that the value of kurtosis equal three is corresponding to Gaussian distribution again. And um, when we have a skewness less than three, that means um, we will have the asperities uh, uh, sitting uh, further again, uh, from each other. But when we, will when we have kurtosis about three, uh, that means we will have more, uh, uh, you know, sharp asperities sitting very close to each other. So what 
we use these um, uh, use for is for um, integrating this into the numerical simulation. And because those Hamrock formula, empirical um, formulas are not useful uh, most of the time because it will not give us uh, a better understanding about the film thickness and what happens in the real case scenario. We have to have a numerical simulation uh, to be able to calculate the pressure distribution, the friction shear, the film thickness, the flash temperature. Um, and to do so, we need to uh, numerically solve Reynolds equation for line or point contact. And here you see a, an example result for a line contact solution that didn't uh, consider the roughness. And as you can see, there is a, a parabolic uh, pressure distribution at the uh, contact area. We can calculate uh, distribution for the friction shear. Uh, we see the fin thickness uh, that is being calculated uh, precisely uh, and the flash temperature of uh, the, two, uh, the oil between two surfaces due to frictional heating. And if we add the surface roughness, then you can see that uh, with the numerical simulation, you have a much better uh, capability of uh, estimating uh, the friction shear and the fin thickness and uh, flash temperature uh, that, is, uh, that are important to understand the better um, behavior of the contacting surfaces. So here uh, are, uh, there is an example of uh, comparison between pressure and film thickness for uh, three roughness cases. The first one is ideally a smooth surface, uh, root mean square equals zero. Uh, and then root mean square 0 0.3 micron and the last one 0 0.8 micron. And as you can see, uh, in the case of a smooth surface, we have this green pressure distribution. And as soon as we introduce the roughness, we will see this uh, you know, irregular uh, contact pressure distribution. And by increasing the roughness uh, root mean square, we will have much higher contact pressures at those um, asperity contacts. And if you look at the fin thickness, we see that theoretically, if we don't have any roughness in the equation, we will get a nice fin thickness. But in reality, the amount of um, um, surface roughness is changing that behavior. And as you can see in this case of red plot with the highest um, uh, roughness value in these uh, three cases, we see that clearly we detect some zero fin thicknesses. That means at these points, the metal to metal is contacting, uh, is uh, happening between the asperities. And those could be the potential position of uh, failure initiation. So here is the, again, another example of how we can apply or use uh, this kind of simulation in practical uh, cases, for example, here in, uh, in the gears. So uh, in this position, uh, there are three contact lines between the gear teeth, and we can calculate the pressure distribution, film thickness, friction shear, and so on for those uh, line uh, contacts. And if um, we do repeat that, for the whole mesh cycle from when the, a, a given tooth is starting to come into contact and when it is coming out of contact and we map the total result over the gear flank, we can see the history of pressure, uh, fin thickness, um, flash temperature over the flank. And uh, we can optimize our gear geometry uh, to have the most uniform pressure possible, the highest amount of fin thickness achievable, and the lowest um, flash temperature uh, we can get. Um, 
we can do the same with using roughness, of course, uh, to have a more realistic representation of the gear surfaces. And at the end, the whole uh, methodology that I presented here, the goal is we need these type of calculation and numerical simulation to be able to tell about the efficiency of our application. So if we want to calculate the efficiency that is um, defined by uh, the ratio of power loss over the input power, uh, we see that that efficiency basically is coming into uh, two category of losses. Uh, the first uh, type of uh, power loss is load dependent that are coming from bearing friction uh, or gear friction in a gearbox. And the second uh, part is the load independent components that is usually drag torque, you know, churning loss, windage effect or uh, uh, friction loss due to seals. And um, uh, here we just focus on the brick, uh, bearing friction and gear friction. And just to give you uh, the final example of the everything that I presented here boils down practically to this um, last two slides that uh, what we uh, usually can do is from the system level analysis, we can calculate the load distribution over uh, single components. In this case, for example, for bearing, um, we use uh, Promax in Linamar uh, to calculate the load distribution over the uh, bearing elements. And then I apply the numerical simulation for each contact uh, points on those uh, load distribution to calculate friction shear. And this friction shear at each individual component uh, gives me uh, the friction loss. And I integrate all these rolling elements in order to calculate total friction loss for a given load and speed. And if I repeat this process for, a several, for several loads and a speed value, I can then come up with a map of friction loss or later can, we can define this um, with, a, uh, with a efficiency value and see uh, what is our operational condition for the, for the bearing application. Uh, we do the same for the gears. So when we do the gear analysis load sharing, uh, we uh, calculate the loads for all contact lines that are starting from the beginning of the contact and all up to the end of contact for a, a given tooth. Uh, and then we calculate uh, the EHL uh, parameters uh, for all those contact lines. And as you can see, then we can uh, plot the friction loss, instantaneous friction loss over the mesh cycle. And then uh, we take the average as the uh, average value of the friction loss or efficiency uh, for a gear application. So thank you for listening. And if you have any question. So I have a question. Actually, two questions. Uh, the first question is, so we, we can do all this calculation before we make the part, right? Or these are yes, done for, the, the, okay. Exactly. The good thing is um, because we cannot always, it is expensive to make a part and then test it. The idea is in the design stage, when we select our bearings based on a given load or, uh, you know, a design parameter or requirement, or we, we uh, design our gears, before doing the manufacturing, we can do this type of calculation to tell one, if the design parameters are good enough to minimize the friction 
and maximize efficiency and potentially also avoid failure? Or what if the oil that is suggested to use in a given application, uh, is this oil uh, is good for this application or we should, because uh, another you know, important um, parameter in the gear, gearbox design is if you use a high viscosity oil, you will uh, lose a portion of your energy as friction loss, another portion as those um, uh, load independent, drag, churning, windage, and seal. So in the case of high viscosity oil, these values, the secondary uh, friction, uh, uh, secondary loss uh, values are becoming important. And we would like to reduce them because friction, we can, we can minimize, we cannot avoid it. We can, we can just minimize this. Yeah. But these are something that we can avoid with a proper type of oil selection. So nowadays, especially that uh, EV industry is you know, booming, um, yeah. in EV cars, they have to use ultra low oil, ultra low viscosity oils. Why? Because the rotation speed of the gears are reaching sometime to 15,000 RPM. And in that such high rotational speed, the churning and drag effect is become too high that is not acceptable by any measure. So they have to use a very low viscosity oil, but that will harm the components from the surface um, initiated uh, fatigue failure. So to find out the, the best ballpark of the viscosity value mm -hmm. to minimize this secondary effect and also have a good lubrication regime, we need this type of calculation in advance. Good. And uh, comparing calculated numbers with the real world, how close they are? So, um, you know, the, the value of the efficiency themselves is uh, very close when we, with a couple of components that I tested when we measured uh, for our uh, gearboxes and we estimated with this methodology. But the value of film thickness itself, it is not easy to be measured in the, uh, you know, with a specific, specifically with the rough surface uh, in the practical cases. So to do the validation for that case, for the film thickness value, um, uh, I did, uh, you know, model validation with uh, published uh, experimental data that is uh, being uh, done in other universities. So that is the basis um, uh, validation methodology in order to apply the model for the real case scenario. But uh, I can say that with the at least bearing um, efficiency that we were able to measure practically in our uh, test setup, uh, the prediction of friction loss and efficiency was very closely matched to what we observed. I see, okay, thank you very much. So yeah. any other questions? Uh, Sina, Mr. Mahakar, if you have. Uh, I was a student last short year. I would like to take this opportunity and thank Oteza for his uh, very interesting presentation. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, thank you very much. Sina, do you have any question for Morteza? You are mute, Sina. Oh, so, I'm so sorry, Morteza. That's and, okay. Um, I, uh, me too. I wanted to, to thank you so much for all this, uh, you know, interesting information, although it was over and above my head. The detail was so, <laughs> me too. So uh, we are learning here. It reminded me of my, you know, mechanics at the university. <laughs> It's yeah. been a long time, but uh, uh, let me just a few seconds tell you why yeah. I want to ask you a question. Uh, my uh, my field really is uh, interdisciplinary. I 
uh, jump myself into various type of uh, uh, you know science or subjects and to try to connect them and utilize them in you know kind of brainstorming and work this is part of my work mm -hmm. and this session actually gave me all kind of new ideas one of them was and i wanted to share with you to see uh, how uh, you could give me some some thoughts about the electromagnetic uh, and uh, you know magnet basically technology mm -hmm. to uh, to fight friction and uh, you know wearing and all those things which is a big thing i mean uh, yeah. apparently um just wanted to uh, to hear from you and how, how probably is going to influence future you know future so is the, probably is going to be really yeah you see um basically this uh, methodology that i described here and you see the direct application of the methodology on the bearing and gears as the practical components that we regularly see in the gearboxes uh, they can basically applied on any other type of surface, as long as we can do the uh, simulation to know about the load analysis mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, a load distribution on that uh, uh, touching components, then we can do the same type of calculation in order to come up with the uh, required uh, design parameter or any other answer that uh, we need to give. But um, in some electromagnetic uh, components, I guess it is not always uh, easy to use oil. Some of mm -hmm. them, they rely on air, uh, uh, like uh, air bearings or um, somehow some type of solid uh, uh, materials that act mm -hmm. as a solid lubricant. So okay. I'm not really too much um, uh, familiar uh, with, the, with those kind of uh, applications, but I can imagine that um, if we can define the interface contact correctly, mm -hmm. then we can probably um, apply the same principle uh, to, to, to estimate the failure, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the future brings a lot of applications for those uh, non non frictional really because mm -hmm. if it's you know that that barrier of like uh, those uh, rail systems for example yeah, in yeah, Japan yeah. or you know all those things we could really get into you uh, you're talking about zero friction you know type of situation right yeah uh, you know for for example in the case of uh, wheel and rail uh, situation. So one um, type of calculation that we can apply uh, from this study is, imagine when the rail is wet and the water uh, is on the rail and the wheel is passing about that, um, you would be able to calculate um, the, uh, the, what happens there in terms of the thickness layer uh, that is there or you know if there is any is there any level of um, friction that we need to have and the secondary um, thing is when we consider the contact analysis between the wheel and rail and we take into account the roughness the real shape roughness um, we can also calculate the surface and subsurface stresses more accurately. And they are actually very important when we want to calculate the uh, surface fatigue life and tell how many cycles this wheel or this rail is uh, lasting um, to you know, have the enough to, to have a good life expect expectancy. Thank you so much, Mortiza. Appreciate it. Yeah. By the way, I just sent you an invite on LinkedIn. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, I'll accept it after that. <laughs> it's my pleasure. Thank you very much. So um, if there is not any more question, Mortiza, do you have anything to add at the end of the talk or? Um, no, other than uh, if, if you 
have any other uh, specific question about this application, still you can direct message me in LinkedIn or uh, maybe if you need, I can share uh, more material such as my papers or other things that uh, if you are interested to know more details, but I try to just keep the level of high level information and detailed information balanced to just not, uh, you know, confuse uh, too much. <laughs> Oh, thank and, uh, you very much. You did great. Thank you. Um, yeah, sure. Mr. Mohaqiq, if you have anything to add before we close the session, please. You are you're mute. Uh, you are mute, Mr. Mohaqiq. <laughs> okay. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, uh, I would like to really appreciate all your excellent presentation. Very interesting slides. And it took me to 50 years ago <laughs> of my <laughs> university. Nice. <laughs> yeah, 50 years ago, half century ago, and all those vectors, all those mechanical equations, and you know, yeah, yeah, all yeah. the papers is just uh, refreshing my memory. And you know, I, I was a student, I really did, and I really appreciate, and I hope that in the future we have this chance and have you here with us for more presentation. Thank you. Of course, it's my pleasure. Okay, thank you, Morteza. Thank you, everybody. So have a great night and we chat later. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. All the best.